All right. What's up, everybody listening and watching? Welcome to another episode of Epic Thoughts. I know this is a treat. Um, we, we've been cranking these out very uh, often now, which is really cool. Uh, if you were listening to the last Epic Thoughts, you were actually, before I get there, I want to say what's up to my uh, co host that I couldn't do this without, which is the Finn Laysons. Ivy and Carla say what's up. Good, what's good? You should say yeah, what's good. good. <laughs> cool. Um, so, like I said before, before I interrupted myself, if you were familiar with our last episode that we did of Epic Thoughts, you um, heard from some of our um, some of our friends, uh, family members uh, of our generation, of our culture, of our race. You heard the black people speak, and and we had a lot of good dialogue. It was interesting dialogue. If you didn't get a chance, go ahead and listen to it. It was really good, insightful. Had a lot of good dialogue and ideas. However, a lot we of feel. Opinion. A lot of depth. Thank you, Ivy. A lot of different opinions. That's for sure. 100%. Um, however, I think one of the pure things about this show, Epic Thought, is uh, we always want to give the other side. We always want to give perspective from both angles. We just don't want to show it one way or see it one way or pitch it one way. So we thought, what better way to do is to have another panel, but with non-African Americans. Um, so we picked... <clears throat> Some gentleman that has been uh, been on the show before. Both of them have been on the show before. Again, just like the last panel, they had different backgrounds, different upbringings, and they had different ideas. And so we're just going to discuss everything that's been going on with the George Floyd uh, incident leading to the protests, it's leading to the riots, and then what do we move on to from here? So I just want to introduce them to you. Uh, our first one, I'm going to introduce, just say a couple <clears throat> of words. He was on our show a couple years ago and almost about the same kind of subject. We were talking about the same subject. And uh, it's Maddie. Maddie, how are you? I'm good, bro. Thanks for uh, having me on. Awesome. And my other guest, been with us since we were uh, babies and pacifiers, uh, but he was on the show a couple weeks ago. Uh, Matt Hemmel's on the line. Say what's up, Matt. Hello, hello. Man, we go back to putting paper bags on microphones. <laughs> <laughs> that's a diffuser right there anyway yeah. <laughs> um so let's just get started man it's been a um a whirlwind of effect the last week you know uh, also with that being said coming out of covid it's just been an all-round just bubbles a bit like things have been boiling to this point and i feel like america's hit a breaking point um Let's start, I'll ask you the same first question I asked the uh, other gentleman on Monday. What was your initial reaction? We'll start with you, Maddie. What was your initial reaction when you, if you saw the George Floyd video, if you glanced at it, did you think, oh man, here we go? Or what was your initial thought when you saw or heard about what had happened to George Floyd? I'll start with Maddie. Yeah. I've made a, I made it a point to never jump to conclusions. Um, anytime the police are involved in a use of force in detaining or apprehending a suspect, it looks bad on camera. It doesn't look good. It's not something that is appealing. It's not something that people want to see. So whenever I see some type of video like that in the media, I always reserve my judgment and wait because what's common is there's more facts than what the media is putting out. And I'll give it some time and I'll start doing my research and I start reaching out to blogs and start reaching out to research. I have contacts all over the nation. And what commonly happens is more facts arise than what the media gave you in that 30 second clip. Um, that wasn't true in this scenario. This officer messed up bad and there were no extenuating circumstances. It didn't make sense why he was on his neck for so long. It's not something that's trained. It's not something that's practiced. It's something that happens. There, there's times you have to do that to detain somebody and overcome their resistance for a very, very brief time. And I mean, I would feel 30 seconds to a minute would be more than enough on somebody's neck. Um, I can't recall ever seeing somebody be on somebody's neck longer than that. I can't remember ever being on somebody's neck longer than that 
So as the facts started coming out, four minutes after he was unresponsive, eight minutes, um, it, it was appalling. And I think any professional in law enforcement felt the same way. Um, and the more research I looked into it, people felt the same way I did. And people felt the same way citizens did. There's not an excuse for it. Sometimes citizens don't understand why officers have to do certain things. But this one, even officers didn't understand. It wasn't just police chiefs that were disagreeing with this, who can sometimes be political. It was line officers, line officers who are out there on the streets every day and had a problem with it. So um, I know that's maybe a long-winded answer, but um, that's exactly how I feel. It, there's no justification that I've been able to find, that I've been able to wrestle with in my mind, um, nor has anybody been able to talk with me and been able to justify it. Now, quick follow-up question. Being that you are retired, do police train to put their knees on people's necks or not? No. We train okay. to put our knees sometimes across the back, the okay. torso area, because this is the largest part of your body. If right. I can get uh, control of the suspect that way and somebody can um, get control of the hands, then that's a great way to get control. But even the back, we try not to stay on too long because that's fairly dangerous. But the neck, that's sometimes in the fight, in the heat of the battle. So that's what I was saying. It can happen, mm -hmm. but it's definitely not a trained thing. It's definitely not a proved thing. And it's definitely mm -hmm. one of those things that when you end up on the neck, get off it as quick as possible. Because um, that can happen. Your knee can slip up to the neck from the back if the person is actively resisting. Um, and so sometimes that will give you an advantage to get the handcuffs on. And then I can get off. And then I can put my knee back on his um, upper torso and back to keep him under control. Never, never are we trained to put our knee um, in their neck and hold pressure that way um, for any amount of time, let alone the amount of time that that officer did. So another follow-up question. You said, uh, how many people do you think it would take when you are applying a knee to the back? Because there was three guys on that guy. That's what so, makes it a little bit so more the video the video I saw only shows Officer Chauvin on him. I don't see the other three officers, which is why I always say there's, I'm waiting for other camera angles. I'm waiting to see other things. I never make rush judgment um, because the video can, it's only two dimensional. It doesn't tell you all the facts. Um, as far as how many people it takes, there's never a right answer to that. Um, have you ever seen the small, white, 95-pound tweaker girl and eight officers are trying to get her into custody? You can't because they're wiry and they're doing things. It's much more of a challenge. So the amount of officers isn't really the question. It's more the tactics that were employed, in my opinion. Awesome. Thank you. That's, uh, Matt, how about you? What was your initial reaction when you saw it? For me, it was it was a couple of things at once, um, it, it, and I'm going to be honest. It was okay. First of all, this is out of control. Um, the amount of time that they had on that dude's neck was ridiculous. Uh, you know, um, at the same time, I was a little numb um, because you see these things in the media so much. Um, but then when I started watching how long this thing was happening. I was like, Ugh, we are a pack. And I was like, I'm sitting there watching this video like this is going to, this is going to explode. This is like, I don't even know what's going to happen. And obviously we're seeing it play out now, but um, I was just like, wow, this is, this is nuts. So now here we are a um, few days later, um, there's, protesting, there's rioting, there's looting. Uh, Maddie, talk to us a little bit about the issues that come with the complications. And if you could speak to it a little bit, why are people so upset even in the protest? A lot outside of, of um, actually before I answer that question, talk to us about what is going on um, when there's riot, when there's protesting what's the concept behind policing a protest what is it that is trained 
What is it that we're, they're trying to do? Are they allowed to protest? Where is the line drawn? And how did we get from peaceful protests to where we are now? Was it instigated by officers? Was it instigated by people? Uh, what led up to it, in your opinion? So there's about five different questions you asked there. I know. So I'll try and uh, peel back the onion on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm going to address it first from the protest side. Are they allowed to protest? What goes into all that stuff? And address that part of it first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, there's allowed to protest. I'm also a constitutional law professor at a local community college. So I believe in our constitution. I support our constitution. I swore an oath to defend our constitution against people foreign and domestic, terrorist force and domestic, okay? So that's an oath that officers take very, very seriously. So the right to peaceably protest and the right to peaceably, the right to protest and peaceably assemble comes in your first amendment, okay? Officers support that 100%. They swear an oath to have to do that. Whether they agree with the protest or not, and I give the example commonly that no matter what side of the fence you are on abortion, if pro-life wants to have a protest and march down the streets and they have the permit, we have to protect them. If pro-choice wants to have a protest, we have to protect them. If the KKK wants to have a protest or a demonstration and they have the right permits or they're legally protesting in the, in the, within their rights, we have to protect them whether or not we agree with them. BLM, we have to protect them, whether or not we agree with them. So from a First Amendment point of view, every cop, every cop in the nation takes that oath. It's the same oath a firefighter takes, every civil servant who works for the city or county or state takes, and every federal employee takes, okay? Our military takes the same oath. So from that, absolutely they have the right to protest. Peeling back that a little bit. There's a big difference between the protests and the rioters. And I have obviously firsthand people telling me there's a big difference between the protesters who are legally protesting, respectfully protesting, maybe loudly protesting, but they're not being criminals. They're not criminally protesting. And that's the difference. One's legal, one's illegal. When you start destroying other people's property, when you start throwing Molotov cocktails, acid, feces, bricks, frozen water bottles, empty water, just water bottles at officers, you're now a criminal. And that's a big difference. That's not a legal protest, okay? That's now a crime. So what we're seeing, officers that are on the street, what they were seeing is the people who were protesting and wanting to give a voice to George Floyd and the problems that were going on weren't those people. They were infiltrated by a criminal element that came in and two totally separate entities. Does that answer your question or kind of where you're going with it? It does. It does. It does. So in, in one more, just one little touch, because I discussed this in one of my classes last night. We're in a changing time in our country. And obviously this will be a, um, a, a landmark change in law enforcement, I'm sure. When was the last time any of you on this panel here saw police officers kneeling with protesters in solidarity? Never. Not, Never. not just police chiefs, line level officers. When was the last time you saw that? Never. Never. How about, we, how, when was the last time you read about it in a history book? Never. Never. Does that show you how <clears throat> connected the law enforcement is with the protest and how wrong that was with George Floyd. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. done my research. I'm on police blogs. I'm on police sites. I'm talking with trainers across the nation. I have not found any person who are use of force experts also who can defend what he did. Police officers are right with the community like they always are, but right with the community in this protest. And yet there's a criminal element that's taken it upon themselves to cause havoc. One follow-up question of that is, why do you think it took so long for law enforcement to stand behind a righteous cause of action? There's been several people that's been killed unjustly by cops. 
Why is this the first time? So I think that's where the different of opinion, education, or knowledge occurs. I don't think there have been several others. There haven't. In the, being an expert in use of force and tactics mm -hmm. and education and training, I had this discussion with somebody. There, there haven't been any ones. This one is the landmark case. All of the other ones, the big names that you've heard, the big names that you've heard, the big that was cool. Um, the high profile, cool. uh, high profile cases. High profile, high profile cases. You guys getting that edit? Yeah, there's a feedback. You guys getting that edit? Yeah, there's a feedback. Yeah, we, we hear you, but we don't hear anything else. Like, you'll stop talking. Like, you're fine. Just, just keep okay. going. Okay. So, okay. I'll throw out some high, high, uh, I'll throw out some high, high, uh, you might have to mute yourself, Ramon. You might have to mute yourself, Ramon. Oh, me? Yeah, I think it's your feed that's, and then unmute when you need to talk. Okay. Yeah, there's no feedback now. Um, Michael Brown, Ferguson, okay, was deemed, was 100%, no charges brought. The forensic evidence showed the police officer's account was exactly what happened, not what witnesses said, who ended up recanting on their statements. The witnesses that lied and said Mike Brown's hands were up and hands up, don't shoot. That was all a lie. You look at Alton Sterling, who was selling CDs. I wanna say that was Louisiana, and he's fighting with the cops, reaching for a gun and was shot. It's not unarmed black guys. It's not black versus white. It's not cops versus blacks. What we're seeing is a repeated behavior of resistance, of uncooperation, and non-compliance that's causing these things. And there was an Arizona pastor after Ferguson um, who was leading the hands up, don't shoot uh, march and with his parishioners and the Maricopa County sheriffs asked him to come out. After he got some training, he absolutely said, comply. We can talk another day. Comply and don't die. And that was a hashtag I was using for weeks after that. And no person who complied today died. Nobody. Nobody who complied today died. You know, no, George Floyd. Eric Garner. Say that again? Eric Garner, who got put in an illegal chokehold. The first I can't breathe guy. I remember that one, and I've done research on that one too. That was also not necessarily all that illegal. He was non-compliant. That was a big guy. It took like eight officers to do it, so they ended up doing a chokehold. That chokehold was out of policy, but not illegal. And that officer was fired and terminated for being out of policy and not using proper tactics, but it wasn't illegal. You have to do things to overcome resistance. In California, we have a penal code, um, 832, that illustrates the way officers are allowed to use force. And the first one is to effect an arrest. The next one is to overcome resistance. And the next one is to prevent escape. Those are the three reasons that an officer is allowed to use force. And in Eric Gardner's case, he was actively resisting the entire time. At no point did he comply. Had he complied and put his hands behind his back, he'd still be alive today. He may well, not agree with the arrest, but that takes care of in court. That's not something that's settled on the streets. What but, was the op Oh, sorry, go ahead. So. Look, there's so many, other, and that's why I say there's so many other factors. Did it look bad? Yeah. Was it horrible? Yeah. Did the EMTs show um, indifference when they came to help Air Gardner? Yes. There are a lot of factors, and that's what I think people are kind of talking about, too, that there's just an inherent um, divide that needs to come down. So in, in reference to your question, why are everybody supporting this one? Because this one was absolutely 100% wrong. There wasn't, there is no justification. And our fear, there's a lot of us already talking, our fear after the, the coroner report came out and said that he, like every other in custody death, they don't die from the officer. They die because they have pre-existing medical conditions. He dies because he has, Eric Gardner had cardiomegaly. His heart was enlarged. He had high blood pressure. He was ob ob grossly obese. Um, I don't remember if he was on drugs or not. 
But those three things combined with the damage that was caused by the inappropriate chokehold caused his death. Well, when you look at George Floyd, the coroner report already came out that he had coronary artery disease. He had high blood pressure. He was under the influence of methamphetamine and fentanyl. And then he was involved in a fight. My, our prayer and a lot of us are worried what happens if 12 jurors acquit this guy. All it takes one. And that's, mm -hmm. that's going to cause another uproar. When every single cop in California, in the United States, is with the community on this, some fancy attorney, if he gets them off, that's going to cause problems. Um, we're already yeah. looking at that. What about the conflict between the private um, autopsy report that's been in the media in comparison with the coroner's report? How I, didn't know, I didn't hear that there was a private one done for George Floyd. What did that say? Asphyxiation. So, okay. According to, according to the headlines, because I haven't looked into it, and in, in, to be honest, to really know everything that's in there. I mean, I also read that it said that he had COVID-19 back in April. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, then that's going to be the cause of death these days is COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the problem when you get 12 jurors, you never know what can happen. And when you get a, a, a good attorney, you never know what can happen. And fortunately, I think the pendulum is swinging that you've seen some wrong actions where cops have had. There was a cop in Texas about a year ago, responded to a, uh, an open door, loud noise party at like two in the morning. And it was a grandma playing video games with her grandson. Do you guys remember something like that? I'll look up the case. Well, she answers the door and he shot her. Okay. Yeah. So he was tried and convicted for murder 15 years. Um, wow. there was, an, there was another officer, gosh, I was just reading about this, um, back East, same type of situation, tried convicted for murder. Okay. I think that was a Florida case. So you're seeing cops get arrested and convicted when they screw up like that. Okay. Rightfully so, you know, even if it's a manslaughter charge and you didn't intend to do it, you, you we're held to a higher standard, you know? So that's a good thing. It's starting to swing. And I think maybe that's a better answer to your question, Rufus, is you're starting to see cops that are screwing up, that are righteously screwing up, are being convicted and held accountable by their citizens. So I pray that Minnesota, um, Minneapolis, does the same thing for this officer. Why don't you think we know about that case you just mentioned, about <coughs> the cop that got convicted for shooting this woman in her own home? Why don't, why don't we know about that? It's not sexy to the media. The media would rather you be upset. The media would rather you riot. They get paid. They love this right now. This, if you think back to the media, what's their job? To sell newspapers. Now it's all digital and internet and stuff. But their job is to sensationalize. Their job is to do these riots. Okay? It's incumbent upon them to stir up strife. So they're not going to tell you those good things. They're just like they're not going to show you the cop that's hugging the kid that just got rescued out of a um, GTA. If you're not watching or following police departments, because now the police departments are starting to get good with that with Instagram and trying to pat themselves on the back since the media is not doing that. But if you're not following those, you don't see it. So mainstream media doesn't report that, you know, they report one death. Okay. All by, by all means it needed to be. But they have so much influence, 50 states are rioting right now. 50 states are protesting right now. Nobody's reporting, or very little time is being reported, that I want to say there's been eight law enforcement officers' death this weekend because of all these riots. More cops are being killed than, than black men by cops this weekend. Okay? And some people are happy about that. So that's what is, the media is doing. I think you're not hearing things because the media tells you what they want you to hear. Now, how do you think we mend the relationship between cops and minority cops and minority? I'll ask the question again. How do you think we That's mend the relationship between cops and minorities? See, that's a tough one because I feel it's already there. I work the streets. And the city that I just retired from, we have such a great relationships in our community. But it's because we've laid that foundation. We have 
BLM in our town. We have NAACP in our town. We have a large Mexican national population in our town. We're connected with our faith-based faith -based communities. And we're out there working with our communities and developing partnerships on a daily basis. That's how we do things. And most departments, especially in California, do that. And one thing I point out is when people bring up those top 25 names, uh, people that have died, none of them are in California. Right, that's what I was just about to say. Minneapolis is known to have racists and bad cops. Yeah. So how do you take a police department that is known to abuse their powers, how do they go forth, in your opinion, to mend the relationship with the minorities or even the people that they patrol and supposed to protect? How do they win back the trust, in your opinion? I think California is the template. We are the role model for law enforcement. And that sounds very arrogant, but it's true because NYPD is a great organization, Chicago PD, Boston, all those places, those are great organizations. Nobody does it like we do in California. That's why you're not seeing these things. We're more of a profession than law enforcement is in the Midwest and on the East Coast. So the only way that I could speak to how they do it is do it like us. Well, what, how does that look? And some of this is part of the conversation that some of us in the training world are having. Um, maybe what comes out of all this is a national standard of policing which is gonna take a generation to change because of training standards and money, but maybe a national standard as to what happens. It is not uncommon in the Midwest or the South for them to throw you a set of keys and go, here you go, Rufus, you're the deputy for the night. Call me if you need anything. And you didn't go through training because the academy is not for six months, but they need a deputy on tonight, okay? That don't happen in California. It won't happen in California. You go through a six month academy, then you go through six months of training with an FTO, and then you're still probably on probation a year after that. So it's a one to two year process. Whereas in other places in this country, that's not true. Um, and then if they do go through academy, their training standards aren't what California's are. Um, I mean, what's the likelihood of them doing that? Because then you're basically federalizing every police department if you do a, a one, one size fits all type deal for police. Yeah, and that's the problem. Why do you think we have so many police departments in this state? You know, in the jurisdiction that I retired from, we had five different police departments. We had the police department, the sheriff's department, the school police department, the railroad police department. So four. So four different police departments that could converge, let alone border cities. And see, oh, CHP, there's your fifth one for the county area. So how do we do that everybody wants their piece of the pie can that happen yeah there could be a congressional law that says they make a standard and i think that's what's coming out of this demonstration is that i hope that sparks a conversation that is ongoing community policing we've been doing it for 25 years okay for not longer um and most departments have made great strides in that this may spark a conversation that says Maybe we need federal standards. Maybe we need to meet a certain level um, of training before we hit the streets. Can you ever get rid of racism? Nah. You ever been to the South? Yep. Civil War is still alive, ain't it? In Atlanta. <laughs> but we were in the city. like Right? Oh. But there are certain places in the South where that Civil War is still going on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When so I was you, doing FEMA work, I was in Florida. Yeah. Now there's so, some questionable parts of Florida. <laughs> right. And there's places that they say, hey, don't go here after night. You're not allowed in that area. So tell me in California where that happens. Because we're not in this. San Bernardino. <laughs> right? Uh, and nobody right. Anyway, just want to go there. But, but we tell everybody don't but go that's there. that's everybody. Right. Right. Everybody. everybody. Right. San Bernardino. <laughs> nobody can go to San Bernardino. I, so, I have a, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead and finish. No, I don't want to take all the time. I was going to say, hey, Matt wants to say something. I was going to say, I want to, I want to know, is this, and this is for both of you, is this a issue of police on black or is this an issue of police brutality as a whole? What do you think is 
is is this just an isolated incident on just one demographic? I mean, Matt, what's your experience with police? Me, uh, it's been interesting. Um, you know, there was a, a moment I, I talked to you about Carla, um, where I was, you know, with my brother. He's Mexican, and my best friend Damar, and he's black. And we were, I think, we went to go get something to eat. And we're in Rancho, and we got off the freeway. And uh, cop was following us for a couple, you know, exits. So we get off. He's still following us. I signal, you know, police get behind you. You're ten and two. You stiffen up. You know, everybody's acting right. Nobody's relaxed. And so I signaled into the complex, and uh, everything was good. He followed me into the complex, and then the moment I rolled my car to the right a little bit into the guest parking spot that I always park my car, uh, we got lit up because I didn't signal, and um, which I thought was a little odd, but okay, fine. So, you know, I'm very much with law enforcement, even though, um, you know, my experience, they've always been a little rough around the edges. I think that's just a character thing, a trait for them. Uh, I'm very much yes sir, no sir, compliance. What do you want me to do? Like, I'll throw everything out the window. Like, I don't care. So he took my information and ran it and then said, hey, you know, can you step out of the car? And I'm young, I don't know my rights. I really don't, you know, have any place to be arguing with him. So I did. So I got out and he starts, you know, searching me. And he, uh, you know, like slightly whispered in my ear and I was pretty calm. Um, Cause I knew we didn't do anything wrong. And he had said in my ear, he's like, are you okay? Like concerned, not necessarily that I was, I, I, he didn't pick up that I was nervous cause I wasn't. But it was more of like, are you, you know, being held against your will? by these guys or whatever like that's just the kind of the vibe I got and I could be way off I don't know the call he just came off of you know like I there's so many factors that you just don't know um and then after that he said you know can I pull your friends out of the car and search them and I was like sure no problem um and I didn't think anything of it because we're all squeaky clean there's no drugs there's no guns we didn't commit any serious crimes so I'm like yeah let's do it and you know that whole neighborhood came out and backup showed up. I mean, and it was interesting, but uh, he, no ticket, no citation, no nothing. Um, so it was very strange. And, you know, it's like every time, you know, I was with somebody of color, um, we seemed to get pulled over, got off with warnings, nothing ever, bad ever happened. But we all, I always got pulled over for some reason, at least once or twice with, you know, whoever the person was. Um, and then when I'm by myself, I always get pulled over for a crime, right? I'm speeding, right? That's my go-to. Um, so, but it, it just, for me, it's always been a little bit odd, especially because I've had primarily black friends my entire life. Um, uh, it, it's, it's something that I've seen. And so, but at the same time, when you look at the statistics, the numbers show a very different story. Um, you know, so it's, it's one of those things like I'm fighting, you know, trying to be objective. Um, against you know, my personal and emotional experiences that I've had with really close friends where we didn't, we did nothing. Right. But um, yeah, so I'm, it's a, and I'm always trying to be the guy that's like running off of numbers and data. I don't want to be the one that's just running off pure emotion and sensationalization from the media and all that crap. Um, so, but it's I, like, I, I kind of know the truth, you know, but I, I have that feeling part still that's just like, mm. It just doesn't sit right. So, but I don't think, statistic wise, I don't think there is a cop on black issue. Um, just looking at the numbers. Um, so that's kind of my position on it. And um, everyone that I hear the, the facts and the numbers, I always <laughs> tell them, it's more to it than just the numbers of what's currently going on. It's sure. The history that falls behind it for us. Sure. That I mean, I still have parents who were born during the civil rights movement, like my mom and dad. One was born in the 50s, one was born in the early 60s. Right. So their parents really faced a lot of racism. Mm -hmm. And so did sure. they, but not Absolutely. to the same degree as they did. So we still have generations in the black community that are still alive that can remember the racism and the police brutality. And that gets passed on from generation to generation. That's Absolutely. why you see these parents telling their sons you know if you get pulled over don't reach in your pockets don't do this don't do that make sure you always keep your hands at 10 and 2 and you see a cop don't look him in the eye because that's the stuff that's been passed on from generation and just wasn't made sure. up it was stuff that sure really sure and so when people start giving us the statistics that's why you have a lot of 
black people that get mad at that because right. like it's more than just what's happening. It, it keeps happening. It's like we never could get a break from something. Something is constantly happening to us unjustly from our perspective. So I'll speak to that a little bit. Um, I, I think you're dead on. And I, I do a lot of generational leadership training. Um, and we've spoken about that, that our parents and our grandparents grew up through that. And so culturally, my, I, my mom worked at Housing Authority downtown. So I spent a lot of time in Jordan Downs and Nickerson when I was a kid. And culturally, you see things passed down in generations. And grandma will tell you something. But where'd grandma from? Grandma's from the South and came out to California. Sometimes, a lot of times. So their stories are very true and their experiences are very true. And then when that's passed down to these generations, one time that a cop stops them, then it's, you're right, the police are racist, they stopped me. Baby, they stopped you because, you know, you ran a stop sign, it ain't a big deal. That's, that's not, we didn't stop you because you were black. Um, and so what I see happening in the future, what I pray is happening in the future, is Generation Z and Generation Y, the millennials, and then our next generation, which is Generation Z, they're the most racially tolerant generation that we've ever had, okay? Just like this meeting, interracial couples, not a big deal. Not a big deal these days. 20 years ago, you might have got an eye for that. You might have, people might have looked and scoffed and maybe somebody might have been brazen and said something. Nowadays, that ain't a big deal. So what I see is in the future, within the next 20 years, you're not going to see these racist ideologies. You know, race baiters are going to have no job anymore. Okay. Because you're already seeing it. Who's out there, who's out there protesting and rioting right now? Is it all the blacks? It's everybody, every race. Everybody. And, and, and that's- Does that not prove your point? Right. Well, my point was to Matt with the whole statistics thing. Right. Uh, he's, he's gone right now. Right. How about, you know, how little black people are unjustly beat by the cops compared to cops on whites? My whole issue is cops, period, with when they overstep their power and they use uh, abusive force, that can come in any color from a cop, whether it be black, white, brown, purple, because the, the case that just happened in Atlanta, where the cops just got fired, five of them were black, and one of them was white. Yep. They heard about removing the protesters, when they removed from, the the protesters car. from the cars. And the, the use of, a, of excessive force. So For being out. out my, my biggest issue is police overstepping their true authority and using that, and using that aggression, because they can, they can hit you in the back of the head. They can grab you and snatch you out. But if you have a certain type of reflex, now they have the right to kill you because I'm protecting myself. So unfortunately, that's a perception and a feeling. And sometimes that comes from experience, but a lot more times it comes from hearing a story from somebody else. And those types of incidents aren't happening like they did 20 years ago. Okay. Right. No, I, years ago. I agree with that. Agree. That ain't happening every day. Um, are there people that may abuse their authority? Sure. Fractionally, you have to look at the numbers. It's less than 1% of officers that are doing this. Is there, when you go the millions amount of contacts that police have with everyday Americans every day and the amounts of force are infinitely small in negative interactions. Like it's 0 0.004 to negative. So you have to look at the numbers when you look at the Uniform Crime Code, which is stats reported all over the nation and reported to the FBI, and blacks are responsible for 54% of armed robberies in the United States, 49% of the murders, okay? Well, if you're a cop, who do you look to when you're looking for criminals? 50%, that makes you drawn to that. So there's a flip side to that coin. We need to change black culture. We need to change black culture to be responsible. Here's a touchy subject, and I remember Ro talking about touchy subjects. Do y'all know who Larry Elder is? Yep. He preaches on this very commonly, okay? We need fathers in the home. And it's not just black fathers, it's every father. I just did some research on that in the census. 
in 2017 said that out of 19 million children, one out of every four is living without a father. Okay. They didn't do race, just one out of every four. And if you don't have a father in the home, statistically, more likely to go to prison, more likely to commit crime, more likely to be teenage pregnant, more likely to abuse alcohol and drugs. Does that sound like the black community right now? Sounds like a lot of communities. It does, but largely in the black community, okay? And that's the problem. Are there people who are born in the exact same environments, given the exact same opportunities, who come out of that, who don't do drugs, who don't do um, crime, who come out and are able to thrive? Yes because we're all given the same opportunities, but we're not all raised in the same households. You know, parenting's hard. Some people have values and they are spread to them and some people don't. I don't, I, I have a hard time putting all the blame on the police. It's kind of like the teacher analogy when Johnny comes home and he had a bad grade. There used to be a time we said, what's up Johnny? How come you not listen to your teacher? Where now the common thing is, well, Mrs. Jones, how come you're not teaching Johnny? Sometimes we have to start taking accountability in our communities and start growing and developing one another because there are successful people out there. Look at YouTube. You have a YouTube, you have a blog or a, uh, what do you call this? Podcast. You guys are out spreading the message. You have a faith, okay, that's breathed by the love of God that is trying to get that out there, okay? Is there culpability on both sides? Sure. But I think if I showed you what law enforcement's been doing for the, thousand, thousand, the last 30 years in our communities, you'd be surprised because they're out there doing things. They're out there trying to help people. Watts. You ever heard of the Watts Bears? Mm -mm. Yeah, because it's barely on the television. Gosh, I can't remember the captain's name right now. Um, Taraz, I'll think of it in a second. Captain goes into Southeast Bureau LAPD. Watts. Okay. And on the job officers are coaching Pop Warner football teams in the communities. What? Look up Watts Bears. The cops are coaching these kids. The cops are tutoring these kids, okay, in the projects. And then you hear moms going, this is great. You know, our kids get to, they have a partnership with these cops growing up. So they understand that the cops are people too. And the cops get to have relationships with these kids and watch them grow. Now they're in high school. So now they're maybe not leaning towards that gang lifestyle. They're leaning towards, hey, I'm going to get out of this place and do well. Um, you'd be amazed at the community inroads that law enforcement has done overwhelmingly in California. I can't speak to the nation. Um, I know they're doing stuff too, but I can just speak to stories I know locally. Um, and we've been in the community. We've been working with faith-based organizations. We've been working with business owners. We've been working with community um, activists to bridge those gaps. I think a lot of what you're hearing sometimes is the media perpetuation of the cycle. They want to continue to divide. It's good for their business. The follow-up yeah. question too about the statistics. Oh, did you want to say something, Ralph? I wanted to ask Matt a question. <laughs> you, looks great over there, Matt. He came back. Um, but hold, your question, hold your question, Carla, because you may want to add it on to the question that I'm asking. Um, Matt, uh, you know, hearing Maddie talk, and, and I've talked to Carla many times, she always talks about um, this is part of an agenda to keep us separated. Do you see that happening? Do you see, um, do you see the protests as being, um, I, I don't know what I'm, word I'm looking for, hijacked? Manipulated. You, manipulated. Manipulated and hijacked. And why do you think that they're trying to separate us from your perspective? What do you think, why do they not want us uh seeing eye to eye on this matter i think the play is control i think it's a bigger issue i think it's political control in my opinion um as far as the protest being hijacked i i'm all for you know legal protest i i get it but you know some of the videos that are coming out now with you know these guys finding you know pallets of bricks everywhere and uh, you know all these setups and all of these people that you know all these white folks that are, you know, spray painting, you know, and damaging and doing all this damage. It's like, it's, it feels as though it is a setup. And I've seen the videos of, of, you know, people in the protests actually grabbing the idiots that are causing the damage and the vandalism and trying to shut them down and saying, Hey, this is not what we're here for. 
Um, but the media is not going to play on that. And unfortunately, you know, people are going to believe what they want to believe. And the media is so good at pumping fear into our society, into our communities. And, you know, we're all watching the movie from, you know, the same movie from two screens or three screens. It's the same thing we're watching, but we all, you know, start with our, our, our big emotions, all of our presuppositions. And then we take those into how we interpret this stuff. And it just, it's easy to see how people can divide um, and crazily divide. I mean, to the death out here right now um, over what the media is, is putting out. So I absolutely believe it's, it's a play for control. And then I think that this thing has been hijacked. How do we not fit into that? How do you? Like, how, how, do you, how do you reconcile not feeding in to what the media is showing, but people genu genuinely feel the injustice within their community? How do you convince somebody that has been seen or has seen this for their life right sure how do you convince somebody how do you change somebody's mind what do you I, do that is a great question i don't know to be honest I, and i'm always been you know when somebody's made up their mind you're not going to change it uh, i don't think there's anything you can do on any side right um not too many folk um are open to following the truth wherever it leads and not too many folk are open to having conversations that could be very, 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 very painful for all the parties involved um, to get to the truth and to get to the bottom of this. Do we have issues amongst ourselves? Sure, absolutely. Um, but until we come together and you know get over this divide that's being shoved down our throats, we're, we're gonna lose this game. And a lot of lives are gonna are be lost. A lot of blood is gonna be shed all because of that. So it's. I, I don't know how to change somebody's mind. I've never been able to. Um, I've been able to, I try to like, I try to ask questions that, you know, provoke thought. I try to leave a rock in people's shoes, uh, especially, you know, I, I studied apologetics for a little bit. And so I started learning like the Socratic method and really asking those hard questions. Um, but even then it doesn't matter. And there's some folks that are so consistent that they're like, yeah, okay, get it. You're right. That's true. But Da, 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 and they're not going to let go of the beliefs that they have. Why they continue to hold on to them, I don't know, um, to be honest. I'm sure there's uh, multiple reasons as to why. Um, but, I, I, yeah, that's a tough one. Changing somebody's mind is well, – because it, it's, it's a matter of mind and changing the heart at the same time. Well, my follow-up question is how do you tell somebody that their experience is wrong? Because these are people's experiences. So it's like – you want unity amongst the people that you love and care for, right? You can't. But, your feelings and they're already on the defense. Uh, I'm like, what happened? I couldn't hear anything. Can you guys hear? Uh, yeah. yeah? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, okay. Matt, repeat your answer because uh, I think your answer cut out. I was asking what, she was asking a follow-up question. Yeah, my follow-up question is, how do you tell somebody that their experience is not right? Like, how do you tell somebody that what they've experienced isn't right in the sake of unifying? Because it's almost like in order to unify, somebody has to yield. You know what I'm saying? Like, somebody's going to have to yield and somebody's going to have to give in. I think both have to yield. So, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah I, you can't negate anybody's experience. You just can't. Because it's their experience. It's their, you know, their feelings, their uh, emotions, their trauma. Um, you can't, no matter who it is. Um, I, I think what you have to do is keep looking forward and trying to find the good, you know, and the common ground, and then working from there, um, you know, and even to the point where you guys could be eye to eye with without invalidating their experience. Now, I want to say, Ramon, and to Ivy, because you guys really didn't get to talk, what's your experience with law enforcement? Since you have, you know, what's your experience? Um, 
I've never really had a bad experience with law enforcement. <laughs> so, but I know people who have, um, but I never really was doing, well, I can't even say doing stuff I wasn't supposed to be doing, but yeah, my experience has been positive. I mean, I ran into the, the cop who was a dick, but I was wrong because I was driving with expired tags. I just thought, you know, you could let me off instead of towing my car, you know? <laughs> so, so that's... <laughs> You're like, dang it. I remember that day. Right. You have to come out. I had to, my car seat was in the back and he was just a, he was just a dick. So I had to get, take everything out of my truck. But at least let me do that. But so. do you feel like it was racially no, motivated? No, I, I just had expired tags for a few months. <laughs> It was, it was my fault. It was my fault. <laughs> I, take full blame. I didn't throw a fit. You know, I wasn't all mad. I was, uh, wasn't upset. I just was like, come on, man. Let me just get off with a ticket. You don't got to impound my car. But other than that, no. I've actually been let go a few times when I was actually should have got ticketed. So, Ramon? Um, I've, I've run into the police a few times in my day. I can't say that I'm proud of it. Uh, I will say, um, and this is 95. I talked about, uh, I watched my friend get pushed against the wall by a police officer. And that was my first time experiencing cop uh, police activity in that level. But I was reminded uh, last night while I was laying in bed about 95. I had just graduated high school. And my friend was a movie, he was trying to make a movie for one of his classes. And part of the movie, he wanted um, people to have guns. And we were, I remember we were at Red Hill Park across the street from my high school, outside of my high school. And I pulled the guns out of his backpack and they didn't have the, the orange tip on them. And I remember playing with them underneath a tree. I was sitting at a tree and there was two of them and I was spinning them on my fingers like that. And I'm pointing them at, and I'm the only black guy in a group of like six other kids. So they're all sitting in the tree. I'm pointing the guns at them. And uh, I remember just enjoying my day. And all of a sudden, I hear a helicopter over my head. And I kind of looked at the helicopter. And I kind of just kept pointing the gun. And then the helicopter started talking to me. And it said, I, I, it was unaudible at first because I didn't think they were talking to me. I was like, ooh, they after somebody. And then Thank God one of my friends goes, bro, you're holding guns. And then I tuned in to what the helicopter was telling me. And it said, under the tree, throw out your guns right now. So I tossed them both, threw them out. And then they told me, you know, come out. Because I was under the shade. They told me to stand out, come out. So I came out. They had me lay down on the grass and put my hands behind my head. And then everybody else, they did the same thing, told all the other white kids. And then um, immediately I heard the helicopter kind of fly off and police from every direction was running at me, telling me not to move, don't do nothing. They were coming out the bushes. I mean, they were loaded and they were ready to go. And they handcuffed me and handcuffed my friends and then they pulled me away and asked me a bunch of questions. They asked me some weird questions like, What's your name? I said, Ramon. I said, but what's your name? I said, Ramon. What do people call you? Ramon. And they're like, do you have a gang name? I was like, Ramon. You know, so all that stuff. <laughs> um, and I do remember one officer, when they realized it was toy guns, uh, they kind of, one officer walked up to me and, and I didn't realize he had grabbed the gun. He pointed, he goes, what do you think of that? And I kind of jerked because I thought it was a real gun. And he says, that's what we thought. We thought you were holding a real gun. And he goes, and we were ordered to fire because you were pointing at people. And um, he said, we were ordered to fire and somebody said, hold. And so we held position, but we were ordered to kill you. Wow. And so that was 95. And I've had moments. It's like a positive experience. It does to me too. <laughs> I didn't even get a ticket. I didn't get nothing. They, they were like, we're going to destroy the guns. I was like, destroy them. Whatever you got to do. I'll do it for you. I'll He's destroy like, it. What do you want me to do? So that was my experience. I mean, I've had other experiences that weren't positive. Um, 
and I, I, I can't say if it was racist or not. I, um, I would just say it was ignorant sometimes, which leads me to my next question, and, and both Matts can speak on it, um, because you mentioned California, and, and I, I actually trust most police officers in California. I've never had really an issue with, I, like you, Ivy, I've been pulled over, and I'm like, dang it, they got me. And then they let me go. And I'm like, oh, cool. But we had a conversation, and the conversation on Monday, one of the people were talking about, is it beneficial to have police officers um, protect the counties and the communities that they're from? Um, is there an issue in these other states where police officers are not familiar with Black culture, so maybe they're intimidated and maybe they, they have like, um, pre, uh, pre, like prejudgmental fear and they're responding Implicit out of that? What was that, Carla? Implicit bias. There you go. Do you think that that is a possible issue? And, and both Matt's can speak on it. Um, so what do you guys think of that question? I'll go, go first. Um, I was talking to my wife about this the other day and, and we were, you know, throwing around scenarios like, okay, well, let's say an officer was assigned to a certain area that was, let's just say the population was 100% black. Well, 100% of the crime is going to be committed by black people in that area. But let's say they live 45 minutes east or west, whatever, and they live in the burbs and all of these things and in a totally different neighborhood. Um, you know, I, I think that they could, without proper training, without, you know, the ability to kind of compartmentalize and see things for what they are, I, I think that that could easily be a possibility where you carry that, that stereotype with you to your neighborhood. To where you live. Um, so I, I could definitely see some value in policing your own area. Um, but I, you know, what you guys talked about Monday, there's just, uh, uh, I forget, I don't remember the gentleman's name, but he was, I believe he was an officer. Um, there's just no way it can be done. There's not enough manpower to pull that off. Um, so it definitely, it definitely leads for an interesting situation. Yeah, I like I like what um, Matthew or Maddie said. What they do in California, how they immerse themselves in the communities that they patrol. Mm -hmm. Because unless you do that, unless you know the people that you're patrolling, it gives you a different outlook on life. Like you're not going to be so quick to run, manhandle a kid that you've been coaching. You're right. Be a little. You're going to be a little bit more sympathetic to him. Maybe he had a. Maybe his dad left, or he got you know, in a fight or something, you're, you'll be able to talk about instead of rushing to judgment, using uh, more force than what's needed to on that uh, person. So I think if, as long as these cops start to immerse themselves in the communities that they are patrolling, I think that's a must. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to have any empathy towards the people that you do pull over who may be doing wrong. And at the same time, if, if you're doing something wrong and you know the cop that's coming to get you it's like when if if you had a cool teacher and you was doing something wrong like oh miss johnson's coming let's all right i'm sorry miss johnson I'll, I'll lay down you know what i'm saying maybe not lay down or stop <laughs> so i actually read um i was doing a lot of research on this when i was in school and um there was a study done about races policing their own races and what they found were when Blacks, black officers were the primary officers in the black neighborhoods. They actually used more force. They actually had more complaints because they understood the culture more and they didn't take um, the excuses. That light. Yes. So, and that, I, I found that interesting. I'm like, well, wow, that's interesting because we've wow. heard the same argument. It's something law enforcement's always tried to do, it's something that's always thrown out there. Um, but when I read that study, I'm like, well, wow, that's kind of interesting. I didn't know that. Um, I have friends that are black, that are cops, LAPD, um, a buddy of mine that I went to school with. He says, man, he's like, black culture, I'm an outcast. When I go to family gatherings, I'm an Uncle Tom. He's like, I, my cousins that are in prison or getting out of prison, they're talking smack. He's like, so I have to distance myself from my family sometimes. And that sucks, you know, and I'm doing good, you know. So it's a cultural thing, too, that it's hard for a black man in black culture to come out of that culture and move into law enforcement culture because 
there's almost a betrayal of their color. And so it takes a strong individual to do that, to police their own community. I have two women in my classes yesterday, um, and we were talking about the whole um, George Floyd thing and the riots, and one of them broke down because I wanted to preface that before we started class because I knew there was a lot of tension. And she just broke down. She's like, you know where I'm at, Rob? She's like, you know, I'm, I'm raising a young black man, and um, and then I'm struggling with this, what happened in the media, the riots. And you know, I just started applying for LAPD. She wants to be a cop, a, a cop. So she's feeling that cultural pull and that conflict, you know, and also worried about the safety of her son because the media is saying that that's all we do is kill black people, which is absolutely incorrect. Um, so, and she just broke and she's like, I can't do my presentation today. Ah, not a problem. Like, thank you for being vulnerable. And that's why I kind of brought this up. Um, so you can't, you can't, uh, you can't dismiss that it's affecting people, you know, in different ways. Kind of like what Matt was saying, you can't tell somebody their experience is wrong. It's their experience. We all have experiences through our lenses. Um, you don't know how somebody grew up by the color of their skin. You know, I have a friend who's dark as night. Okay. He grew up with way more money than I had. Okay. It don't matter. You know, color of skin doesn't determine things. I pray for a day. I, I, I thank my mother all the time. I always say she raised me to be colorblind. Okay. And now I'm starting to get away from that, but she did. I don't care what color you are. Okay. If you're an asshole, you're an asshole. Okay. There's black assholes, white assholes, Hispanic assholes, Asian assholes. It's people and you give what you get. But I see a lot of the memes lately. Like, you know, don't be colorblind. Accept me for my color. Good point. Okay. But Rose, not my black friend. Rose, my friend, you know, and when we became friends coaching, I saw the benevolence in this man who volunteered his time at the little league and didn't have a kid playing baseball because he grew up in the neighborhood and loves baseball and the kids love him. The kids flock to him. So then the next year I'm like, I'm going to coach with that guy. Okay. And we get together and plus he won the championship the year before. So I knew he was a winner. And uh, so then we get together. Rose, not my black friend. Rose, my friend, you know, so that I, I'm pulled in that sense where I don't see color, you know, I see person, you know, but I also value and love you for who you are and your heritage. You know, I have friends of every color, every race, every religion. I'm not just friends with Christians, you know, I have Muslim friends, I have Jew friends, you know. So I think when we get to a point in our society where we stop looking at color or stop identifying it, we maybe have less racism, you know? I don't know, because childhood. Rose talked about 25 years ago. All right, I graduated 26 years ago. So in that same sense, there was a black student um, association, black student union at our school. There was Mecha for the Hispanics, and there was an Asian Chinese group and a Japanese group, okay? Well, the school I went to was 45% Asian, 45% Hispanic, and 8% white. Who's the minority? You I was. Okay. There was no white group for us. And it was 1% black. We literally had like five blacks in, you know, South San Gabriel. Um, but there was no white group. And when we jokingly said, hey, we want to have a white group, they're like, no, you're not a minority. Maybe nationally we're not, but at this school we are. We have nobody to connect with and the school dismissed us, blah, blah, blah. Look at the demographics in California. Who's the dominant race in California right now? Hispanics, 51%, okay? That still puts me in a minority group right now. Nationally, I'm not, right? Nationally, I think it's 70% white or something, right? But locally and where you're living, demographics change, you know? And so, but we're getting past it. And I, and I think we were talking earlier that where does this go? I think you're seeing the change. And I think this changes in the next generation. You know, my kids are much more tolerant. Why? Because I raise them that way, you know. But their, kid, their friends are being raised that way. This next generation, the millennials and Generation Z, you're going to see change. You see more interracial marriages being more accepted. You see more tolerance of interracial student groups hanging around. When COVID first happened, 
I hated it. I still hate it. I think it's stupid. I think it's a government control on us, but whatever. But, but what happened was, with the COVID uh, media? The, the riots cured COVID. You didn't see that? So, um, but it was nice going through neighborhoods and the kids that were in packs of five or seven, they weren't all white. They weren't all Mexican. They were interraced. Okay. Kids being junior high and high school kids, you know, kids that are starting to figure things out in life, you know, cause we know the young ones, they're just as colorblind as everybody until they're taught stuff. But I don't know. I, I think I'm seeing things through different lenses and I, I'm in an upper um, middle class neighborhood where you would think it would be all white, but it's not, you know, races, you're starting to see less effect of that. A lot of the stories we're hearing, like you said, were told by our grandparents or our parents and they experienced it. I'm not sure about you, but can you go drink in the same water fountain that I drink in? Yeah, that was 70 years ago, 60 years ago, 60 years ago. Okay. But we still have grandparents that have influence on us and love, you know, and, and they tell stories and they fear. Um, so the BB gun story that you were talking about, Ro, man, when my kids were doing that in the neighborhood, I told them the first thing you do, if you see a cop car, you drop the gun because of Tamir Rice, okay? The kid that was killed in Cincinnati, okay, had a BB gun. That wasn't race, okay? When you get that gun pointed in your face, you don't know what kind of gun it is. Okay. And that was always my worst fear on the job. I didn't have a problem taking somebody's life. That's what happened. If I needed to protect somebody else, I didn't have a problem with that. But killing a teenager with a BB gun who pointed at me, that would have been very hard for me to deal with. And I'm very glad that the Lord never put that on me. Um, but I definitely didn't want one of my kids in my neighborhood that happening to. So it's about education also. You know, it's about teaching. Going back to the community conversation, for the last 30 years, the cops have adopted community policing and we're in the communities. We're in our faith-based organizations talking to people. One thing I always throw out, when's the last time you had a class on how to act when an officer pulls you over? Did you, you guys took that class in high school, right? Yeah, no. Oh, you didn't? Oh, but you went to college, right? You took that class in college? Oh, you didn't? Well, that's interesting. I got a self-taught class. By? My folks. My dad. Right. My dad taught okay. me how. <laughs> that's, right that's what and we so, gotta get and that's so and that's what a black guy gets because you learn those things i've had the same conversation with my academy kids yesterday because they were going home during the um what was it called curfew so we're like dudes if you guys get pulled over because you're driving home after curfew hands on the steering wheel don't do this don't do that we're giving them that lecture some of them have already had that lecture because of the communities they grew up in some of them haven't okay I always tell this story about my chiropractor's wife. She says, oh my gosh, when I get pulled over, I start getting the registration out. I want to have everything ready. I said, Karen, if you did that in my neighborhood where I work, I would have put a gun in your ear. And I said, stop moving. She's like, oh my goodness, why? Because I have no idea who you are. I have, but she didn't grow up that way. She wasn't taught, put your hands up. She just wanted to be prepared for the officer. I said, no, if you rolled through my city like that, I'd put a gun in your head. I have no idea you didn't kill Ken on your way home and you're grabbing the gun. We all know not to reach around because the neighborhoods we grew up in. So I offer that as a lot of it's education. A lot of it's teaching our kids how to interact with cops. You may get that education in the neighborhood you grew up in or with the parents you have, but some don't. And then they wonder why the cops sticking a gun in their head or being a jerk telling them not to move because I don't know who you are and I didn't know if you killed anybody. So I think that education and training goes a long way. Um, but I also think our future generations, you're going to see the change. It's going to happen. And people might credit the protests and that's a good thing, whatever. It sparks a conversation. And I think that conversation that needs to be an ongoing dialogue two way. So on that, I, I know we get, we're getting close. We got to get out of here real quick. Um, but I do got two more questions that I would like both of you to answer. The first question is uh, if there wasn't a protest, would there be dialogue? If there was, if, if there was no protest, would there be dialogue? Because during this, at this moment, this is all we're talking about. This is all people talk about. You're right. This riot has cured COVID. But at the same time, um, do you feel as a white man that this conversation would have happened if there was no riots? We'll start with, you, you can go first, Matt. 
Not I, so. I, I don't think so. These are, there's so many conversations that happen, you know, in, with different cultural groups behind everybody else's back. And, you know, we've all got our opinions. We've all got our experiences. We've all got our statistics and, you know, all of the things that we've learned and experienced. Um, but nobody wants to take the time to talk about it. Um, so I don't, I don't think that now that this is a big issue and it's serious and, you know, you got guys protecting their businesses with, you know, you got 30 guys in front of a business with all ARs ready to go. Like, this is serious. This isn't like anything else that I've ever seen. Um, so I don't think that we would have had the conversation ever. I mean, there would have been small pockets that have, I think have always been there like this forums like this. Um, but on a national scale, I do not think there would be. Okay. How about you, Maddie? I think this was so earth changing this event again. You had every cop in America on the same side, almost without question. Um, I think with protests, you would have seen the dialogue. I believe the riots are absolutely taking away from that right now. I believe the unrest um, that is occurring is taking away from the conversation right now. And it's totally detracting from the conversation. Um, I think you would have had good protests and you would have had good dialogue because every cop, not just administration, political people, every cop was on your side. And I think that that's where dialogue would have begun. So as soon as we can get the unrest and the um, anarchy to stop, I think you'll see a conversation. And I hope that that continues as a ongoing dialogue. Um, but everything Matt said is true. It, it, there's a two way and there's venues like this that have always been open. But I do think you'll see a dialogue. I don't think this is going to go away. But I think, how do we even start until we can control society? You know, you have anarchy right now. So, so before you, sh I, I know you said you want a video, you want to show. So real quick, as white men, what do you say to your children um, in the midst of this? What, what's the message? And if we have people who are who are white and they watch this and I've, I've gotten texts or emails say, I don't know what to tell my kids. I don't know what to tell my kids in the wake of everything I'm seeing. What can you say to that? What can you speak to them and say, hey, this is what I tell my son. Like, you both of you have our dads and your husbands. So what is it that you say? Well, you go with you first, Matt. I think for my son, it's I, – I don't like lying to him. Um, I'll give him um, age-appropriate truth. Um, and so we talked about it last night, actually. And I told him what happened because, you know, he's got a history of, you know, Black History Month comes around and, you know, schools teach, uh, you know, history. And um, so he has a, a vague idea. Um, but I just told him straight up, hey, dude, this happened, this and this. Because he came in late the other night. I was like, dude, you need to be in, you know, before it's dark. And it was dark. And I was like, dude, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, and we don't know what's going on up here in Vegas. Vegas has been actually pretty peaceful. Uh, there's been a couple of officers that have been shot, but for the most part, not too much vandalism. They've kind of kept it under control. Um, but still you hear, you know, uh, my ring app goes off all the time. All they're protesting is getting closer. And, you know, we've heard the gunshots up here. We also hear the fireworks. Um, you know, so I just told him, I said, Hey, this is what happened. There was, you know, an officer that, you know, did something really, really bad. You know, he was white, the guy was black. And I said, it's causing a lot of tension between everybody right now. And, you know, the reason I wanted you home is because I want you to be safe, right? And, but he knows we teach him, now most of his friends are black. Um, and I think that's just the, fortunately for us, it's, we're in a community where the schools are predominantly black on this side of the town. Um, and so he's got a lot of black friends. And so he doesn't see color. He doesn't have any issues with it. And with me having such a diverse background of friends, um, you know, it's easy for me to have that conversation of like, hey, dude, um, we're all equal. We're all going to sin. We're all going to do terrible things. We're all going to do amazing things. We're all capable of doing all kinds of things. But your, the color of your skin has nothing, nothing to do with this. So when you look at somebody with a different color it, of skin, it's not you can't judge them based upon that. 
you know. So I try to keep it as raw and real as possible. I mean, he's only eight, um, but we've had some serious conversations. And um, it, it's just, it's telling them the truth and, and being righteous about what you're telling them. Um, you know, I, I, if you're going to get caught up in a media narrative, I don't care what side you're on, if you're white, um, then I feel bad for your kids. Um, but if, if there's objective parents out there who are going to be real and say, hey, this is a shitty situation, man, um, and here's what it is, then I, I, think, you, I think those kids are going to be better off for it. So what, what do you guys say to the, uh, the backlash to the All Lives Matter thing that's happening? Um, for me, I really don't – it's definitely it comes off as a slight for sure. Um, I get the intent of both sides, one side saying black lives, the other one saying all lives. It's not helpful to the conversation. I think it stifles dialogue. Um, it shuts people down immediately. You know, the opposing side is defensive and it kills any opportunity for growth, any opportunity for unity. So, um, you know, objectively speaking, they do. Right. I think we all agree with that. Um, but running around with it on your sign and posting it on social media and all of these things, I don't think it's helpful. I actually think it's det detrimental to our unity and us coming together. I agree. If we were to have a, if we were going to have a conversation, um, I wouldn't try to do it because it shuts down anybody on the Black Lives Matter side. Um, I think that conversation goes, I've always been All Lives Matter. That's what I do. That's my job. So when we say one life matters more than others, that's a hard thing for us to grasp. Um, that being said, the backlash was Blue Lives Matter during all this. So I didn't promote that because I think that's where, like Matt's saying, that's where clash happens. Um, I don't have a problem saying all lives matter. I think your life is no important, more important than that life, no more important than that life. And there's a lot of memes going where you have black officer, white officer pointing at each other, like his life matters. Yeah, his life matters too. So, but in the context of if I'm sitting across with black lives matter, um, personnel um, members where we're having a discussion, it does nothing to facilitate that conversation. And I, I totally agree with Matt. I would not bring that up on a more global perspective. Yeah, I absolutely believe all lives matter because how does the Hispanic community think if black lives matter? Does, are there's less? What's the Asian communities think? So, um, but that's not a conversation that it would be helpful during these times. Um, timing is everything. So right now it's about, okay, Black Lives Matter, let's discuss what we need to do for that conversation. It's not worth being at this Sarah, like Matt said, there's no growth that comes from that. You wanna respond to that? No? Gentlemen, I, I thank you for uh, sharing. And um, this has been, I liked it. It was a lot of information, a lot of perspective. Um, Maddie, you said you had a video. What I'll do is I'll add it on at the end of it so we can post it. I just added it to the chat. Maybe you can play it. Oh, I could play it. Yeah, I can. So I'm going to play it um, and then we'll, we'll take us out. But before we do that, um, Matt Himmel, do you have anything else you want to share before we go? And then Maddie, one more, if you have one more thought, Matt. I really am just praying and it's, this has been really hard for me. It's really messed me up because I've, I, I think I can see all sides, all concerns. Uh, I think as we all, all can here, and uh, you know, I know peace doesn't come without conflict, um, but I'm praying that we can get through this conflict as fast as possible, so we can get to a more peaceful environment. Because um, this is this is crazy. Not only for you know my kids, but my kids' kids, and so on and so forth. If we don't squash this now, it's just going to get worse. Um, I just like to close that. I'm so thankful that you invited um, both Matt and I to come talk. I think if more people took the time to listen to one another across cultural lines, across racial lines, we would be a much better society for it. Um, so I'm thankful for this opportunity. Um, Ro, I tell you that all the time. You call me anytime you want and I'll be on with you and Carla, no problem. Um, so I'm happy to talk with you guys, obviously. 
Um, this video is just kind of a close to this topic. Um, post Peace Officer Standards and Training in California, put this video together a few years ago. I'm a racial profiling instructor, went through the Museum of Tolerance training, and I teach um, racial profiling. We have to go through training every five years on this. Um, and they put this video out, um, reference uh, procedural justice. So take a minute and watch it and tell me what you guys think. All right, we're gonna play it right now. Although I can't hang out for what you guys think because I gotta go. All right. All right, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Matt. You, Matt. Appreciate it. Okay, hold on here. <laughs> Especially as long as it takes Roe to get up on it. <laughs> and just you should really be able to just click the link. Yeah, the, when I share it, it the chat goes off. Ah. Uh, there it goes. You know, I knew I was going to get pulled over. What do you mean? I mean, I've been working all day. I'm just trying to get to the store, go home. But I'm a black man I'm wearing a hoodie. I knew I was screwed. I didn't know you were black when I stopped you. I was right across the intersection from you and you rolled through the stop sign. Yeah, well, a lot of people do, but I feel like I'm the one who gets stopped all the time. Sorry you feel that way. I don't know why you may have been stopped before, but I can only tell you why I stopped you tonight. It's because you ran the stop sign, nothing else. Do you understand how scared I am when I get pulled over? Tell me why you're scared. Cops get nervous when they pull over a black guy. And I don't know how this is gonna end. I just don't want to get shot. Okay, I get it. Been a lot of things causing mistrust, but I never know what's going to happen either when I make a traffic stop. I want you to be able to trust the police, to trust me. I don't want you to be scared. You're the first cop I've talked to that understands there's problems. And I think that maybe if I could talk to other cops like this, I don't know, I'd be less afraid. If we could all talk like this, maybe everyone would be less afraid. Will you remember this conversation when you come to my car? It matters. More than you know. Sir. Good evening. That's a good video. I like that. If only you get it to the right cops. Yeah. Every cop sees it. That video came out almost five years ago. In California? Yes, sir. Or everywhere. California. Where the I'm talking, about, I'm talking about other states. I get it. California get it. doesn't have as many issues as the other states do. Because we have a dialogue. So but I think what's awesome about that video is everybody comes with their experience. The officer doesn't know who's at that door. They come with that experience. 
the driver has his experience. He thinks he just stopped him because he was black. No, he ran a stop sign. I don't even know what – I saw brake lights. That's all I saw. So I love that video from the sense of it just creates that dialogue. And he says, you're the first cop I talked to. How many of you guys are talking to cops? You know, how, you're, you're hearing grandma's stories. You're hearing your buddy's stories. You said yourself you've never had a bad situation, but you heard other people have situations. We heard, you know, we started spreading those rumors, and they, nobody has had that firsthand bad experience, but we hear those stories. So um, I love you all. Thank you again for keeping me on. I got to go. I got another appointment right now. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate it. And, Matt, I'm with you, brother. I've just been praying for um, – peace and safety and communication. And I pray that uh, these anarchists are um, taken care of swiftly so that the dialogue can begin. And uh, I hope that that's ongoing. Thank you, Matt, so much. Thank you, you, Matt. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Ivy. And uh, yeah, I'm going to stop recording.